I want to begin by letting you know that we have identified our first COVID-19 case in Alberta on a First Nation. Alberta Health Services is working with Sucker Creek First Nation to follow up on a single case there. This individual was a contact of a case in High Prairie and is currently self-isolating. There is no outbreak on the First Nation and we are disclosing this case at the request of that nation to make sure that people have accurate information. The First Nation was well prepared, like other First Nations, and they are responding effectively with help from AHS and Indigenous Services Canada. I also want to note that this community is dealing with a non-COVID related emergency in the form of a flood. It is important to make sure those efforts are not hampered by inaccurate perceptions. As serious as COVID is, communities across Alberta are dealing with other challenges as well. I'd like to commend Sucker Creek First Nation for showing exceptional resilience with support from a strong partnership of health services and all levels of government. And they have my best wishes as they deal with this issue of the flood. For the daily numbers, we have confirmed an additional 306 cases over the last 24 hours, bringing the total number of cases in Alberta to 3,401. Of these, 1,310 people have recovered. Unfortunately, I must also report five additional deaths today, bringing our total to 66. There are also two additional tests in Brooks in people with COVID tests pending. One of these individuals was a worker at the JBS plant site. While we do not know if these two deaths were COVID related, I want it to be clear that investigations are underway to determine that. I want to offer my condolences to the family and friends of all who have lost loved ones. As I have said before, whether we lose loved ones from COVID or any other causes during this time, our grieving process and ability to gather is different under the current restrictions. My sympathies go out to all those mourning the loss of loved ones. Today's total case numbers include 32 confirmed cases directly linked to the Curl Lake outbreak. Of these, 25 individuals are located in Alberta, with 10 being isolated at the work camp and 15 off-site. In addition, seven cases are now being managed outside Alberta, with five in BC, one in Saskatchewan and one in Nova Scotia. You have heard me talking in previous days about the work to verify case numbers. So while this may seem like a rise, I want to assure people that what has happened is we were able to bring all the sources of information together to get the accurate count for today. As of today, there are 375 cases and 44 deaths in continuing care facilities across Alberta. I know many Albertans, including me, want the numbers to stop growing and for outbreaks to end as soon as they are identified. Believe me when I say we are doing everything possible to limit the spread of this virus, both within outbreak settings and across Alberta. My local AHS counterparts are working hard to limit the spread in households linked to the Cargill plant and other outbreaks and to protect the health of everyone involved. Many of the new cases today are linked to outbreaks in Brooks and in households linked to the Cargill plant, which is a reminder of how quickly the virus can spread through close contact. I am working with my colleagues in AHS to offer all necessary supports to households impacted by this virus so that the spread can be stopped. So with respect to the suspected community transmission, what happens is we, we get cases that are reported to us and if on the initial case report it doesn't say that they were connected to a known case, they fall into that bucket of, of suspected community transmission. Uh, but as public health does their investigation, does the follow-up to determine where that case may have been acquired, they sometimes get new information that determines that <clears throat> they were connected to a known case or uh, to a, a site where there were other cases connected. So that's what happened with that significant drop is that we did have, uh, and I don't have the details of, of where those people were connected to, but uh, it's possible that it could have been um, one of the outbreaks that's currently underway. So having people who initially came in and then were identified as actually having a connection and then being uh, allocated into that um, other category of known exposures. 
with respect to how low the case count needs to get, uh, really I think there, there are two things that are important. One is that we're seeing stable or declining uh, rates, particularly of hospitalization, which is going to be our most stable indicator over time. Our total cases are affected by our testing strategy. So going forward, that will hopefully remain stable. We intend to uh, remain accessible to all Albertans who have symptoms going forward. Um, but what we want to see is stable or declining hospitalizations and ideally stable or declining case numbers as well over uh, a time period of, of one to two weeks. But that also has to be um, taken into account that that's part of the picture and then the other part of the picture is where those cases are coming from. And if we have the ability to, for example, identify that many of them are for one particular location or outbreak, and if we have the means to control that outbreak, uh, then again, it's, it's sort of part of a larger picture of the stories behind the cases, how we're able to control it, and those trends over time, rather than an absolute cutoff. And when we did open up that eligibility based on the fact that we had sufficient testing capacity to be able to accommodate some of those additional swabs, uh, what I did is communicated to my colleagues, again, the local medical officers of health are the ones on the ground who know these outbreaks, who know the facilities. And so the direction I gave to them was that in all outbreaks going forward, new outbreaks that are identified in continuing care, long-term care, that uh, the ability to swab everyone who is in that facility, residents and staff, at the time the outbreak is identified, is one additional tool to help with early diagnosis. And so going forward, uh, that's absolutely the part of the outbreak response. For outbreaks that currently are underway, uh, what I said was to really use their best clinical judgment in terms of prioritizing because arranging for all of these swabs to be taken uh, takes some coordination and work. They have to have the workforce to do it and it also is quite uncomfortable for those who get the swabs done. And so if there's an outbreak where there's been no new cases for three weeks and it looks like we might have things well under control, that particular site may not benefit from additional testing and it may actually be more of a burden for people in that facility uh, than it may benefit them. So with respect to the ability to test in existing outbreaks, uh, that's absolutely there based on the clinical judgment of my colleagues at the front line. Uh, but we are focusing again on outbreaks going forward and making sure that we are using our testing capacity to the best clinical effect uh, in order to get the best information to stop these outbreaks uh, and make sure that the spread is contained as quickly as possible.